We are live on YouTube. Going live in five, four, three, two. We are live. Thanks. We'll just give a, a minute for everybody to join. Okay, thank you all for joining us for this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Just start uh, introductions this week. My name is Michael Ivan. Um, I'm one of the uh, neurosurgeons here at the University of Miami, uh, co-director of our research for our brain tumor program and a specialist in skull base and brain tumors. I'm joined today by my uh, co-directors, Dr. Komatar, who's a professor and program director of our residency program, also director of the UMBTI in surgical neuro-oncology, Dr. Morcos, who's a professor and co-chairman of the Neurosurgery Department, Director of Skull Base and Cerebrovascular, and Dr. Benjamin, Assistant Professor, Director of our Skull Base Lab, uh, and a Brain Tumor Specialist. Uh, each week or each month now, we've been putting on these symposiums, uh, targeting for education and, and sharing our knowledge for brain tumors across the world. And we couldn't do this without all the help from the administration from the University of Miami, Sylvester Cochrane Cancer Center, and the Department of Neurosurgery, and, and I thank Christina, Roberto, Ingrid, Damari, and Ignacio for all of the help that they continue to do and support us to make this successful. Uh, anybody who's interested in learning more about our symposiums, about the Neuro Department of Neurosurgery here at the University of Miami, you can find us on the website, on social media, or, or on YouTube, where all of their past uh, symposiums have been stored and, and are there for your sharing and, and viewing uh, additional times. Um, so we have multiple symposiums going on. We've decreased the frequency in 2021 to monthly, uh, but we have a pediatric symposium, and this is just a teaser for upcoming symposiums. So uh, next Monday, we have a pediatric symposium going to be targeting uh, spinal disorders in the pa pediatric population with Dr. Groves and Dr. Huang. Uh, and then Dr. Morcos on March 18th on Thursday, which is the third Thursday of the month, will be having a, a great uh, group of panelists talking about endoscopic and open skull base surgery with Dr. Gardner, Dr. Uh, Cohen-Gadal, uh, Fernandez-Mirandez, and Dr. Caldwell. So be sure to tune into those. 
as far as uh, our symposium, we also have a teaser for next month. Uh, we're doing the first Wednesday of every month uh, for uh, keynote speakers. And uh, next month, we'll have Dr. Laws joining us from Harvard to talk about uh, Cushing's disease and his vast experience with management of this disorder. So be sure to check that out. For uh, housekeeping, please uh, let's try to make this as interactive as possible. We try to get to everybody's questions throughout the talk. So use the Q&A button at the bottom. It's the easiest way for us to keep track of your questions and get to them. We don't offer CME, but you will get an email confirming your participation in tonight. Um, and then also please be sure to like, follow and share uh, our videos and our announcements so that we can continue to grow and, and share these amazing talks with everybody. So tonight uh, we have a great group of panelists all, uh, all supporting University of Miami. Uh, Dr. Del Fuente joins us. She's an assistant professor and she's the new appointed chief of neuro-oncology. Congratulations Macarena uh, for our cancer center. She's also director of clinical research for our brain tumor program. Dr. Segal, who's professor in radiology, also division of our neuroradiology department and uh, vice chair of finance, also part of the Cancer Center, and Dr. Shah, who's an upcoming uh, outstanding uh, surgeon and neurosurgery is our chief resident and is going to be going off to the NIH next year to do a fellowship uh, with Dr. Gilbert on uh, neuro-oncology and has also already completed an NIH R25 fellowship. Um, but tonight's keynote speaker is, uh, I'm very excited to introduce her. Uh, I've known her for many years. Uh, she's been an outstanding mentor and teacher to me uh, from my time at UCSF. And, and, I, and I'm super excited about uh, her talk and her um, uh, topic tonight. She's currently the director of the Division of Neuro-Oncology at UCSF, as well as the director of the Gordon Murray Caregiver Program and of the Sherry Sobrato Brishan Brain Cancer Survivorship Program at UCSF past president of the Society for Neuro-Oncology and, and many, many other titles. Uh, she re received her medical education at the University of British Columbia in Canada, stayed in Toronto to do a residency and fellowship, and then came to UCSF to do a neuro-oncology fellowship where she stayed for the last uh, multiple decades uh, and, and risen the ranks to, to lead an outstanding division. Um, she has more than 200 publications, multiple books, uh, and chapters, including the one up here in the corner, where she's one of the lead authors, uh, which is fantastic for anybody who wants to treat uh, brain tumors. Uh, she's a PI, a co-PI in over 20 uh, active clinical trials um, that uh, cover the spectrum of, of all parts of brain tumor treatment, including novel therapeutics and chemotherapy, as well as convention enhanced delivery and immunotherapy. Uh, she's also one of the key components and co-investigators for the UCSF SPORE grant the longest running NIH SPORE grant in the country for over the last 21 years. Um, she has a, a, a passion for not only uh, treating patients, but also treating uh, their quality of life and their family, and has done so by directing these uh, standing caregiver and survivorship programs at the university, and in doing so has really been recognized with some of the highest patient satisfaction ratings um, and set multiple records at UCSF and, and won awards for Prescani scale and the Pinnacle Award for seven years of, of outstanding recognition by her patients and, and the care that she gives, which is uh, in a feat in of itself and, and should tell you a lot about uh, a service that she's able to provide. Uh, she's involved in neurosurgery, uh, also involved in many of our organizations by being on the executive committee of the WNS section on tumors, the medical neuro-oncology program of the CNS, and is also one of the chairman of the RTOG and, and directing their clinical trials um, uh, protocols. Uh, so she's extremely busy, and I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Chang, for coming out and, and talking to us tonight about one of your passions, which is uh, markers and advanced imaging in gliomas. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. It's been, uh, that was amazing. Um, I'm just getting my screen up. Are you able to see that? Yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Great. Thank you again. And it is really uh, quite a privilege to be here and to have the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing at UCSF um, with regards to advanced imaging of glioma. So um, the first um, thing I would like to acknowledge, of course, is that this is uh, team science. It's what I really love and enjoy is the collaboration, not only with my colleagues in neuro-oncology and in neurosurgeons, but also uh, the basic scientists in the Brain Tumor Center. And then for the last 25 years, working with the imaging team 
both the imaging scientists as well as the neuroradiologists. And uh, we've been very fortunate to get a lot of support from the NIH, but also philanthropic support to pursue um, this type of research. So just to start in terms of the role of imaging, I think when patients present with a, a neurological symptom, uh, the first diagnostic test is an MRI or a CAT scan or MRI scan uh, with and without contrast. And in some cases um, in neuro-oncology, this can be a diagnostic um, test. Here, for example, on the left is an example of a tectal glioma, which is a well-circumscribed non-enhancing mass within the tectum. These, ten, these patients tend to pre present with hydrocephalus and um, after decompression, um, usually there isn't any other treatment that's needed. Uh, we can monitor those patients. Um, in addition, in neuro-oncology, we have some tumors that have a propensity to spread throughout the central nervous system. And here you can see an example of a patient with this uh, medulloblastoma with evidence of hydrocephalus, but also of dissemination in a supratentorial compartment where you can see multiple nodules of enhancement um, in the uh, supratentorial area. And of course, this is going to be very important in terms of not only the prognosis of the patient, but also the therapy. In addition, I think for a surgical um, audience, there is no um, you know, lack of information about how uh, Im imaging helps you with directing the surgical management to assist with maximal safe resection, which is really the first step in, in managing patients with glioma. Um, this is examples of functional imaging with um, magnetoencephalography, but also diffusion tensor imaging um, on preoperative MRI scans to delineate eloquent cortex, uh, to assist with maximal resection. The other major role of imaging, of course, is to non-invasively monitor our patients to detect serial changes that might indicate that the tumor is progressing or indeed whether it's responded to therapy. And so classically, for example, a patient who has undergone surgery, we often will do a post-operative MRI scan within 24 to 48 hours to establish a new baseline. And then during their treatment courses, we undergo, they undergo uh, serial MRI scans to assess response and progression. So, so these are the hallmarks of the roles of imaging in neuro-oncology. The techniques that are used um, are the standard MRI with and without contrast that looks at the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we also use flare imaging, of course, to look at um, the, the uh, water content within the brain and the nature of that water content. The apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC is also looking at the architecture of this tissue and how well um, mobilized is, is the uh, water molecules within the structures. And then of course, perfusion, where we're looking at the um, ability of the tumor to either have new vascularization that tells us a little bit about the biology of the tumor. And so for example, in the lower row, you can see page two patients, both with non-enhancing uh, tumors, one which is very cold on perfusion and the other one that is very highly perfused. And of course, this um, does portend a high perfusion, potentially a more aggressive biology. But uh, there are many challenges in imaging uh, patients with glioma. These tumors are infiltrative and spatially heterogeneous. It makes it very difficult to define the margins. And it's a very poor delineation of tumor burden, especially when you have the sort of infiltrative non-enhancing component, which can be very difficult to discern from things like cerebral edema. There's a large variability in appearance on MRI scan within grade. So here you can see um, in rows with grades two and three and four tumors respectively, the degree of enhancement really cannot tell you necessarily the grade of the tumor. And so with these um, uh, challenges, I think the biggest one, and probably for every, pay, every time you have a tumor board conference, you're probably always looking at these types of scans. And you're looking at patients who've undergone surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or other, um, for example, immunotherapy. And you're looking at these scans where there might be an enlarging, enhancing um, mass. It could be centrally necrotic. And the big question, of course, is, is this treatment effect or is this tumor recurrence? And this has a particular uh, importance, not only for management of the patient, because you have to determine what the prognosis is for these patients and whether to change therapy or, or enroll them into a clinical trial, but also it makes it very challenging then to assess the response to novel therapies if we're not sure 
the, the type of patient we're putting into the study in terms of is this truly tumor um, progression. And so um, many years ago, the, our research goals were focused on looking at non-invasive imaging as a biomarker of biological behavior to develop and implement imaging methods that were allow us to detect early recurrence and to facilitate implementation of new treatment strategies. And we really wanted to just uh, leverage the expertise of, of our environment, our patients, our patients, our brain tumor scientists and the imaging scientists, and ultimately to translate this into clinical practice. So the, the purpose of this presentation today, I'm focusing on our MR spectroscopic studies that we've done over the many years. Now, what is spectroscopic imaging? Uh, these tend to be steady states. So it's, it's analysis of the um, different chemicals within the tissues. Um, the choline is a measure of the uh, membrane uh, component of cells. Creatine is the oxidative status of the, um, the cells. And N-acetyl aspartate is a surrogate of neuronal components. And so you can see that within a a tumor, you can look at the normal brain that has a specific uh, proportions of the respective um, chemicals. And we can also generate these metrics such as the choline to NA index or CNI that tells us that when you have an elevated CNI, you have a tissue that has a lot of uh, membrane turnover, which is usually indicative of replication of cells. And you have a low N-acetyl aspartate because these cells are replacing neuronal components. And so the CNI index is one that can um, differentiate between active tumor and normal brain. We can also look at lactate and lipid because those are telling us a little bit about for example, necrosis that you often see this lipid and lactate of course is anaerobic metabolism. And these can be uh, applied as surrogates for tumor burden with glioma. And so some of the work that we've done is looking at imaging the steady state of lactate and lactate and lipid have a similar um, frequency at which they resonate. And so these are techniques to take away the lipid from the, um, the image and allow us to actually identify lactate within the tissue. And this is some of the, the work that's one of the benefits of working with our team is uh, the bioengineering students are, are very, very um, active and involved in, in determining these types of um, strategies so that we can image uh, tumor or the areas of the brain that we're interested in, in a much more accurate way. Visual representation of the anatomic and the 3D uh, spectroscopic imaging is one, as you know, this is uh, imaging, it's a very visual um, field. And so being able to characterize the, the volume of the entire brain, as you can see here, um, and also look at the choline to NIA index or CNI index in a large geography of the brain is something that, um, uh, again, is, is very important because when we focus on one area of the brain, and if you're just looking at a very limited region, um, oftentimes after treatment, there could be extension of changes that if you haven't captured that within your voxel or box or region of interest, you might miss interpretation of um, what's really happening on a global level. So the ability for us to actually uh, capture this much of the brain um, is really critical. So being able to assess tumor burden on these multi-slice um, pictures here, you can see how we can define that um, the area of infiltrative tumor based on the CNI index. So one of the first things we showed, of course, was that the metabolic lesion differed from the contrast enhancing lesion. Now, oftentimes we think of the contrast enhancing lesion as the sort of focus of the tumor, but we know that this tum these tumors are infiltrative and oftentimes there is this non-enhancing infiltrative area around it. And what we were able to demonstrate was that the metabolic lesion certainly expanded beyond the contrast enhancing lesion. And actually some of the characteristics of CNI lactin lipid would also help us to uh, determine which patients um, had a worse prognosis. And we can actually quantify this using um, these types of uh, values, such as the sum of the lipid in the CNI values and looking at ways that we can characterize um, how we would, the extent of the tumor burden and how this correlates to survival. 
We also were able to um, monitor these patients prospectively looking at this type of imaging in the sort of pre-radiation, post-radiation, and at two months. And here you can see some of the work that we've published on survival analysis, looking at these co-registered serial CNI color maps um, in patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma pre and post treatment. And we've been able to also integrate radiation field overlay. And this is very important when we're trying to characterize at the time of progression. A lot of times, like I said, you know, we have patients where we get scans, the scans look worse. The question is, is this progression or is this um, a treatment effect? And one of the important factors to assess is, okay, what part of the brain had what dosimetry of radiation? And was this in a high field radiation? Did it even get radiation? So this type of information we now have, um, are able to import directly into our imaging studies and be able to overlay not only the metabolic maps, but also the radiation dosimetry maps. So we also were very interested in characterizing biologic and metabolic properties of glioma. And I think this type of work that we developed um, was one of our first um, projects in our program project grant many, many years ago was to really understand the geography of the tissue and where did the samples come from. So this is, this is an example of some of the types of imaging that we acquired in pretty much every patient um, who came for surgery at UCSF. So we had to develop this protocol where we assessed each patient who was undergoing surgery. The patients volunteered to have this uh, scan, which involved the classic T1 weighted with gadolinium, T2 flare, ADC perfusion, and proton spectroscopy. So we acquired this in multiple patients um, across various grades. In this particular case, we were very interested in understanding what um, parameters would highlight a sort of more aggressive area of the tumor. And we were able to then actually guide the um, sample acquisition so that we could understand where in the tissue, in the brain, this particular sample came from. So we were able to get these image guided biopsies, two to four samples to allow us to not only do our histological um, and, and biological correlates, but also potentially to do some ex vivo analysis to help guide us in terms of new metabolites that we might be interested in. Now, in order to do this, uh, it really took a lot of work coordinating the imaging acquisition the surgical intraoperative right acquisition of tissue, understanding the genomic and pathological characteristics of the tissue that was acquired, being able to uh, align that to the imaging properties um, and be able to then um, construct this sort of neuro database that we can then pull out information about the patient's history of surgery, radiation and chemotherapy and put that together in several different projects to ask, ask and answer specific questions. So here's one question that we're asking. How about what is what does the tissue look like between enhancing versus non-enhancing tumor? And here you can see examples of the voxel that we acquired in the non-enhancing component as well as the enhancing component. And being able to um, look at the various comparisons of contrast enhancing versus non-enhancing samples, looking at this sort of ex vivo um, uh, changes. And here you can see the differences between the enhancing and non-enhancing tissue, showing that there was um, quite a bit of difference in terms of the in vivo parameters that was seen, as well as the histological um, uh, findings. We were also very interested in looking at patients who had initial low-grade glioma, and then at some time in their course of their illness progressed. These patients can progress as grade two, grade three, and in astrocytic tumors, grade four. So what we were um, asking the question is, can we use these types of imaging characteristics to determine whether patients have actually uh, upgraded in terms of their um, malignancy? And so here you have two cases. Both patients have very similar um, characteristics in terms of enhancement. So you cannot say that just because of enhancing, it's necessarily a high grade. And here you can see that in one case, um, this patient had a, a, a still a remain a grade two tumor. However, uh, in the second case on the right, this patient actually had a glioblastoma. And so we were able to generate these heat maps of volumetric imaging parameters for patients who had initial grade two, who transformed to either grade two, grade three, or grade four tumors. And so you can see how we are looking at this 
um, heat map to look at um, the various clusterings within GRADE. And what you can realize is, first of all, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the GRADE, especially in the GRADE two tumors. And some of the uh, GRADE two patients, um, tumors had similar characteristics to GRADE three or GRADE four. And what we're doing in the next um, phase of our, um, our study now is look going back to not only look at the uh, sort of of IDH mutation status and all the other molecular characteristics that are so important in determining uh, prognosis for our patients, but also capturing now um, their clinical outcome and being able to then map those to the, uh, the, the multi-parametric um, findings that we found. So what about differentiating treatment effect versus tumor recurrence? That's another project that we had in one of our grants. And what we were able to do is actually take these, um, these cells and, and look at the um, characteristics ex vivo. And what we found was that the myo-inositol to choline ratio and this index now, which is a brand new index, were strong markers of differentiating on uh, grade four glioma versus gliosis in the samples. And this is now part, so we, we, we uh, discovered this in the last cycle of our PO1 grant, and now we're validating that as part of our ongoing um, efforts. And this is some of the work again, um, published just last year uh, in neuro-oncology, looking at recurrent tumor and treatment induced effects and how these have different MR signatures, depending on whether you look at the contrast enhancing or the non-enhancing lesions of the, of the tumors. And here you can see that um, the, the robust number of tissue samples that we're able to acquire across 139 patients who underwent this treatment. And this is a compilation of the work that we've done over um, the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So I think one of the biggest changes in neuro-oncology over the last 10 years has been the uh, characterization of tumors that are much better in terms of predicting prognosis. And this is based on the molecular and cytogenetic characteristics of tumors. Um, of course, for diffuse grade two and grade three tumors, the first uh, mutation that has uh, really been in critical to differentiate the biology of these tumors is the IDH mutation. And then subsequently, whether there is the 1P19 co deletion is present or not. And of course, these are the de definitions now of oligodendroglioma, astrocytoma. And in fact, um, you know, from the work from uh, not only our group, but also, of course, the TCGA, we can identify these um, uh, different characteristics of, of patients in terms of prognosis. And of course, recognizing that there are patients who have what appear to be lower grade tumors that don't have either the um, IDH mutation or 1P19 co deletion, but in fact have a TERT promoter mutation, which tends to be seen in primary glioblastoma. And in fact, these patients have what is now going to be called in the new world. Uh, health organization classification of molecular glioblastoma. And so um, with all of this work showing the different subgroupings, I think some of the questions we had were, can we leverage these changes in the metabolism of these tumors to identify different metabolites? And this is an example of IDH mutation in low-grade glioma, as I mentioned, is like uh, the most common mutation. And you can see here that as a result of this mutation, you get this change in metabolism where you get alpha ketoglutarate being converted to what we call an oncometabolite because it only occurs within these tumors that have the IDH mutation. And you get the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate. So the biggest question there is, can 2-hydroxyglutarate serve as a novel imaging biomarker, not only to diagnose gliomas, but also to predict survival? And of course, we know now too that there are many strategies currently being evaluated to target specifically this mutation of IDH. There are multiple trials, and in fact, there are also vaccines. So can 2-HG be used to determine response to therapy? Well, to determine whether uh, 2-HG can be a good biomarker using spectroscopic imaging, there are a couple of factors that we have to consider. The first is that you know, there is no confounder. There's no normal 2-HG in the background. Um, the level at which 2-HG is produced within these tumors is actually at a level that we should be able to detect with, with um, spectroscopic imaging. And there's really no other cause for an elevation in 2-HG. So not only is it not seen in normal tissue, but for example, if you saw it, in there's no uh, evidence of it in inflammation or any other changes, um, especially this post-radiation, for example, when you see increased enhancement, that wouldn't cause an elevation of 2-HG because it's so specific to the mutation. 
So the implication of all of this is that if you can detect 2-HG, then there's a small likelihood of false positives. So to be able to then pivot that to saying, well, can we use 2-HG as a marker? And can we detect this using steady state um, spectroscopic imaging? Um, you have to understand, well, what does the uh, NMR of 2-hydroxyglutarate looks like? And then can we actually using two ex vivo tissue with from patients that we acquired um, as part of our grants, look at the um, where 2-HG resonates and where the frequency is. So this is some of the work that led up to us being able to uh, try to understand um, what the imaging would look like and where the 2-HG peak might be that we can determine. And this is some of the data acquired pre-surgery in a patient um, confirming that this was an IDH mutated tumor. And here you have two examples, one with an IDH wild type astrocytoma and the other with a IDH um, a mutant. And you can see the, the peak um, that you're looking at. Now, the, the difficulty with this, however, is that the glutamine and glutamate peaks are directly um, superimposed on the 2-HG. And so it can make it very difficult to ascertain. And so we're working now on other methodologies to really assess the IDH mutation. But this is a summary of the work that we did um, looking at non-invasive MRI and uh, steady state spectroscopic imaging as biomarkers for glioma. And this is where we can look at the tumor cell properties, the vascular properties, stromal invasion properties, as well as the other like IDH mutation, malignant transformation, and recurrent tumor versus treatment effect. And these were the non-invasive biomarkers that we could equate with these areas of biological changes within tumors. And the question then is how do we in incorporate all of this in a multi-parametric analysis to correlate to clinical outcome? And this is some of the work that is um, that we published looking at that. And this is actually the focus of one of our projects in our current pro uh, program project where we're now doing a prospective acquisition of tissue to validate the findings that we had in our previous cycle. But I want to move on a little bit now to this exciting area of probing the uh, Warburg effect using metabolic imaging. And this is now dynamic changes in the metabolism of tissue. And here you can see that the differences between normal cells where you have aerobic metabolism and tumor cells or proliferative tissue where you have this transition of pyruvate preferentially to lactate. And it's this change in, um, in between normal and tissue and uh, tumor tissue that can help us differentiate. And so I'll spend the last few minutes um, just talking more about what the work that we've been doing with hyperpolarized C13 imaging. This is a very um, impressive uh, technique that changes the, um, the, the, the signal to noise ratio by improving it to greater than 10,000 fold to detect these uh, different metabolites. And you can see here some of the peaks that you can see using um, hyperpolarized pyruvate. And so what does this mean? We do a number of experiments in live cells and the preclinical work to generate data to confirm that in um, animal models. And this is work of uh, Pavitra Vispanath and Sabrina Ronan. We then translate that then to um, glioma models looking at changes that we can actually appreciate. Here's an example of tumor versus um, uh, no tumor in a, in a signal to noise ratio characterizing this. And then we can look at um, preclinical models of looking at treatment response. So here's one with temozolomide. If you notice, this is at four day after giving temozolomide. So within four days, you can actually see changes of a cytotoxic agent uh, demonstrating that this could be a very nice biomarker that drug got in and did something. One of the hallmarks of the challenges of doing clinical trials um, with novel agents in neuro-oncology. We can also show that this was uh, important and uh, evident in patients with uh, targeted therapies. This is a response to Everolimus, which targets the mTOR uh, pathway. And you can see changes uh, after seven days uh, in a patient, in an animal model. So our research goals kind of pivoted um, over the last four years or so to understand better the utility of hypopolarized C13 metabolic imaging. We wanted to enhance the sensitivity and specificity to look at the dynamic changes, to study metabolic probes that were novel and relevant to molecular subtypes, to look at disease activity, assess response to therapy, and ultimately try to integrate this into our clinical uh, scans. 
So to do this takes a lot of infrastructure and a lot of personnel. This is, um, uh, luckily we have Dan Vigneron, who has, um, he's the director of uh, a P41, looking at the Center for Hyperporosis C13. Um, so this is where we can get the robust uh, technology development. Um, and we have an amazing team that this, didn't, this team didn't exist until about four or five years ago uh, when we decided we wanted to really uh, study hypoporosis C13 uh, in, in patients with brain tumors. And so these are the components you need to actually translate this to patients. Uh, you can see it, it, it takes a lot of hardware, a lot of pre post-processing, regulatory issues to, to get it to starting uh, to study it in patients. And this is what the experiment looks like. So you have the protalization of the agent. Um, we basically do a quality check and then you inject the patient and you um, acquire the imaging. It's two minutes of C13 imaging and then one hour of the standard clinical exam as well as spectroscopic proton spectroscopy. So this is, this is a work that we were able to demonstrate to translate this to um, glioblastoma patients. You can see some of the elegant um, uh, pictures that we've been able to generate. And over the last few, um, last year, especially because of the challenge of patient accrual, we've been able to do a lot of um, work to identify specifically the metabolites of pyruvate, lactate, and bicarbonate. And here you can see some of the dynamic changes of identifying these metabolites as we inject the, um, the pyruvate. We can also look at um, bicarbonate and how we can denoise this, which is very important in terms of looking at the images and characterizing the quantification of these um, changes. And uh, we've also been able to, to do this work with a clinical trial. So we, here you can see a real-time um, assessment of physiologic and C13 spectroscopic imaging before a patient has surgery, after they have surgery, and monitored while they're undergoing treatment with a novel comprehensive genomic testing to identify targeted treatments protocol. Uh, this is some of the work that we've been able to acquire as part of that study. And so we're also looking at C2 pyruvate because that's relevant in IDH mutated tumors. What you have is a, a relative uh, decrease in glutamine because of the, um, the transition of alpha glutamate to, to hydroxyglutarate. So glutamate and glutamine automatically go down as a result of the IDH mutation. And so being able to um, study this in patients, the first we did it in, in volunteers, and this was the first publication of, of studying it in patients. And this is our first patient with um, a IDH mutation showing a decrease in the glutamate uh, production, which is what we would have expected based on the, um, the, the pathways that are affected. We're also looking at looking at a hypopolarized alpha ketoglutarate, and uh, we're working with um, the colleagues at uh, the NIH with uh, Drs. Gilbert and Choiki. And this is uh, something that I think would be very important, of course, for the IDH mutated cohort of patients. We're also um, looking at how we can use imaging for neurocognitive function. Uh, um, we're looking at in other disease types like lymphoma and meningioma, and both Dr. Rubenstein and Dr. Uh, Villanueva have funding to do this. And this is all as a result of the work that we generated in glioblastoma and in glioma. So in summary, um, this is a, a evaluation of novel and advanced image techniques that's focused really on the work that we've done at UCSF. There's certainly a lot of techniques looking at PET, for example, and other um, uh, advanced imaging techniques that I didn't have time to go in with you today. Uh, but this is really to try to improve how we define tumor burden and response to treatment. Uh, we have to take in consideration the molecular and cytogenic characterization of glioma and the effects it has on metabolism. Um, and we, we basically are very fortunate to have the multidisciplinary collaboration with all of the, the team members because none of this work would be really possible, especially the tissue acquired um, uh, sampling that we did uh, it, as part of the, the number of studies that we did to validate the imaging uh, parameters. And the main goal, of course, for all of this is to validate and generalize the implementation of these um, novel techniques into clinical care. And so again, I just wanted to acknowledge the team. Um, I, this is the same slide I had from before, but I also wanted to point it out, um, uh, Sarah Nelson, who um, unfortunately passed a few years ago, but she and I started this whole process about 20, 25 years ago in trying to really define um, the role of imaging 
in how we take care of our patients and so incorporate some of the novel techniques. So I, I just wanted to, to shout out to her um, and the impact she's had on my own career. So thank you again for the allowing me to participate um, in your symposium and I look forward for any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was, that was fantastic. I have, I have a couple of questions. For the C13, um, uh, looking at the hyperparalyzation, do you think that would uniformly affect the whole tumor uh, and only the tumor and not the microenvironment? I'm just wondering if you would see effects in partial tumor or if you had an immunotherapy, would it also affect the immune system or is it really very specific to just glioma? No, I think that's a really good question. You know, when we started looking at normal patients with um, the C13 in the brain, of course, it, it wasn't done before in a patient with a glioblastoma. And it was very interesting to look at the, the fact that we could detect bicarbonate in the normal brain. And so actually, we have this index now of um, lactate being increased in tumor and bicarbonate being decreased. Um, and so you, when you have something that goes up and something goes down, you use an index like that, they can sort of improve the accuracy of the tissue. And so we know that in normal brain, the metabolism um, is very different. And uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see in, in cases of inflammation, for example, um, what kind of changes we would see as a result of, of um, that, that actual tissue characteristics. But we can clearly see um, heterogeneity within the tumor as well. Yeah, no, it's phenomenal. I mean, I think I, understanding the dynamic changes of, of brain tumors in response to treatment, I think is, is really where the future is going. And because once we find out the tumor has grown, it's kind of too late, I feel like in most times. Which brings me to my other question is, you know, the Rainer criteria has been around since, what, 2010, and still relies on basically enhancing lesions and the change in size of enhancing lesions. So, uh, you know, how close do you think we are to, to getting some new criteria out to kind of assess treatment effects and, and other clinical trials that you're not involved in, in brain tumors? Uh, that's a great question. So um, as, as everyone might know, you know, we, uh, the, the formation of the Rano uh, group, working group, was really because of the fact that the standard anatomic imaging was really not uh, telling us about the tissue characteristics of tumor. It was telling us about, for example, a contrast scan is just telling you whether the blood brain barrier is the integrity of it. So is it intact or not? And similarly, um, you know, the flare changes tells us about the water content, right? So um, I think we have a ways to go. We have um, standardized uh, how we acquire imaging. So there is a brain tumor, um, you know, imaging protocol that we're hoping everybody uses so that we at least start talking the same language with how we acquired the, the, the scans. The second is um, uh, looking at ADC and, and perfusion and how that could be helpful and standardizing how we acquire those things. So, you know, I think the challenge initially was everybody was doing ADC differently, um, similarly for perfusion. So the first step was standardizing that. But I think what you're getting at is how do we incorporate these novel imaging techniques to be able to um, really get us to a point of, of uh, seeing that we can actually determine tumor burden. Um, the Europeans have used you know, amino acid PET. It's actually standard in, in Europe. Uh, we still don't have it here. We, we're doing a clinical trial looking at uh, FET PET to try to replicate what was found in, in Europe. But, um, but those, those, those types of studies are still far away. Uh, Macarena, Gaurav, any questions before we, I know Gaurav, uh, well, you'll go next with your cases. Yeah, I can ask one question. Thanks so much, Dr. Chang, that was excellent. Uh, my question is actually regarding the 2HG, uh, you know, the marker you showed. Yes. You know, we have tried that and we've always struggled to figure out whether the uh, peak you see at that is uh, secondly uh, to an actual real peak or is it because of the normal variation on a short TE or is it because of glutamine glutamate? And you mentioned, right. uh, I think you referred to it as, you know, being a little bit of a problem as well. So uh, how have you guys managed to, uh, you know, have you done uh, something like you have a team which does the spectroscopy and how do you determine that the peak is actually a true HG peak or, you know, it's uh, one of these other? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that is the challenge. I think the UT Southwestern group is the one that has really published on on um, identifying the 2HG. We, we cannot replicate the kinds of studies that they were able to, and it sounds like you have it either, to be yeah. able to get a robust measure of 2HG using proton spectroscopy. Uh, the other thing we found is that you had to have a really large tumor, you know, to, to be able to put a box over this. If you have a small tumor, you, there's no way you'd be able to detect the 2HG peak. Um, but we're still challenged with really trying to identify um, what's the glutamine and glutamate. Now, what's interesting is that um, glutamate should go down, right, in a in an IDH mutated tumor. Mm -hmm. So if glutamate goes down and that peak is a similar residence as 2HG, then you could be a little bit more confident that what you're seeing is 2HG, right? Um, but we're shifting to the alpha ketoglutarate um, using that as the hyperpolarized agent. And we're hoping to be able to activate clinical trials using alpha ketoglutarate, um, hopefully in the next year or so. So I think that's, for us, I think that's gonna give us a little bit better SNR because the problem is, you know, the overlap of the, the, the chemicals and the metabolites. Absolutely a challenge. Thank you. I can add to that. We have trying uh, here as uh, well. And I think, as you say, there are one or two patients when you can see like a fantastic peak. And then because of the tumor is not so large or has a surgical cavity that of course is right there, or you have the ventricles and all of that is very challenging to duplicate and make that a reliable uh, test. Yeah. So one of my question was, you know, how we can move forward there. I think we all would love to have this molecular imaging where we can non-invasively uh, identify IDH mutations or MCNT even before first surgery. So we can offer like window of opportunity trials or, you know, uh, enroll the patient like kind of before surgery and do procedures in the OR as part of uh, the trial. So how do you see, you know, we moving forward toward that uh, direction in kind of molecular imaging? Yeah, so hopefully, you know, as I said, with the C13, I think that we are doing that. We, we're imaging patients before surgery, and we're actually um, taking the tumor out and then backtracking to see what we find, right? And that's the way you have to validate these types of studies, these novel studies. Um, in terms of uh, looking at, you know, uh, the, the preclinical work that I showed you was looking at Everolimus as a marker, as a targeted therapy, looking at mTOR um, inhibition. And um, I think some of that work would be very interesting as we test agents in patients. So the idea of doing a window of opportunity study, as you mentioned, but instead of surgery, we use it, use the imaging as the marker, right? So you take, you do your image, you give drug for seven days, you do another image. And if you see a change there in a metabolism, that means that the drug got in, that means the drug did something, right? Now, whether that something correlates to a benefit in terms of efficacy, we don't know that yet, but at least we're answering that question about whether, um, you know, the pharmacodynamic aspect of things, right? That you're actually getting a drug in, which up until now, as you know, every targeted therapy we've tried has been uniformly negative. And a lot of the questions we then go back and ask, well, how much of that drug really got into the tumor to modulate the, the target at the level that we think is going to be beneficial? And so I'm hoping that that's where this non-invasive imaging takes us is to do it in conjunction with novel therapies. But great question. Okay, uh, Gaurav, I know you have a meeting. So did you wanna present just on one or two cases that you had for Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you share your screen or do you have a slide or? Yeah, I'm going to show you a slide. Okay. And I'm glad Dr. Chang focused on uh, 
a task away because uh, I'm going to show uh, two cases and both of them are on uh, on uh, focus on spectroscopy. And um, uh, it's interesting because there are two cases where I'll show you how spectroscopy helped one actually in diagnosing a tumor and one actually ruling out a tumor. So this is the first case we have, the 16 year old who presented with papilledema and vomiting. And you know, you can see this uh, centered in the fourth ventricle, there's a mass here. Um, it's got heterogeneous enhancement. On the sagittal T2 weighted sequence, it looks like it may be coming from the vermis or purely centered in the fourth ventricle. And then, you know, you do a diffusion sequence and you see that there is no restricted diffusion. And, you know, based on the location, it looks very good for a medulloblastoma, but as you guys know, you know, almost, as far as I know, uh, Meloblastoma is always restrict, and then this tumor was not restricting. So we are struggling with what this could be. Maybe it's a ependymoma, maybe it's a medulloblastoma, which is not restricting. Maybe it's a, um, you know, who knows, a high grade glioma. So we uh, end up doing a spectroscopy in this. And um, so at this point, we're thinking of pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, mangioblastoma, maybe a solid type. Or is this a high grade glioma? We do a spectroscopy single voxel on this, and uh, what we see is a very a markedly elevated uh, choline peak here, mm -hmm. and a choline creatine ratio of of close to almost 12. Now, um, I I'm, I remember this case. I read this case, and I I did not know what to do with this. I saw the choline creatine ratio, and I said, you know, this must be a very high grade glioma, and um, and also, by the way, there was a lactate peak at uh, a reversal uh, of the peak at 1.3, which indicates lactate as well. Anyone wants to take a guess what this ended up being? Ashish, why don't you take a stab? A pilocytic astrocytoma. So it's interesting because, you know, um, uh, we always uh, we always in, uh, associate a very high choline gradient ratio with a high grade tumor. But it's interesting that specifically in pilocytic astrocytomas, and this has been reported, uh, the choline gradient ratio can be extremely high. And this is not because of the choline being elevated, but actually because of the creatine being depressed. And, you know, this has been uh, reported in. Um, uh, in action pediatric literature, this is a, an article from AJNR where they looked at the spectroscopy of several pediatric brain tumors, and uh, they and this is quantitative assessment. So this, you know, so they actually measured the amount of uh, metabolites in these tumors, and they found that the creatine is significantly reduced in pilocytic tumors. So therefore, the choline creatine ratio actually is falsely elevated. So whenever you see a very, very high choline creatine ratio, you know, you, you should think, uh, keep this in mind, it could be a pilocytic astrocytoma, obviously in the, you know, in a correct clinical setting. That's one of my cases. And this is a second case. Uh, Mike, do I have time for a second case or? Yeah, yeah, please do. So this is a second case. This is several years back. So I apologize for the quality of these images. Uh, this was a case, I think, like 15 or 20 years ago. This is when spectroscopy was just being developed. And uh, this was given to me by Dr. Bo uh, Bowen, who used to work with us uh, at that time. And, you know, he was one of the pioneers of MR spectroscopy. So, you know, it's a routine um, ring enhancing lesion, left parietal lobe, has got around edema around it. You can see that. So, again, several differentials for this. The thing of abscess, metastasis. Uh, maybe a glioma, high grade glioma. And uh, then we decided to do a spectroscopy uh, on, on, on this mass. And we were actually expecting this to be probably a metastasis or a glioma. And, you know, what we start seeing is this huge peak at around 0.9, right? This is an amino acid peak. And it reverses on the long T as expected. Same thing for 1.3, you see the peak, uh, which is... Uh, uh, at 1.3, either lipid or lactate reverses, so it's a lactate peak. So this is a patient who has very high amino acids and um, lactate, uh, which is uh, seen in the wall of this mass. And this has been uh, described 
uh, in pyogenic abscesses, where you have a peak at 0.9, sorry, uh, which actually represents uh, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, which are all amino acids. So this was also uh, uh, a very nice case where spectroscopy helped us uh, make a diagnosis of an abscess instead of a, of a tumor. So my, those are my two cases. Yeah, I think those are great examples that the, the, the uses of this go well beyond just gliomas and glioblastoma. Yeah. I think the ADC would have been helpful in that case with abscess as well, right? So. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I don't have, this was again a very long case, a uh, long time yeah. ago. But, uh, now this is a pyogenic abscess, of course. And, uh, 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 you know, some abscesses might not show restricted diffusion. So something to be aware of as well. Yeah, I've had a couple of those recently, actually. Um, okay, thank you so much. Those are great. Uh, Ashish, do you want to? Sure, thank you. That was great, Dr. Sagal and Dr. Chang. It was great listening to you again. Uh, I think I remember your talk when you came back to Miami, I think a couple of years ago. So I um, appreciated hearing the update. Um, so, uh, you know, Dr. Ivan asked me to kind of go over a little bit about our University of Miami experience. Uh, you know, exactly evaluating treatment related changes, kind of exactly kind of what you talked about. Um, and we've kind of been doing this for a few years. I think we're a little bit, a few years behind you guys, but I'm curious to see what you think about some of the, some of the work we've done. Um, you know, as Dr. Ivan mentioned, the RAINO criteria has been in existence for such a long time now. And it's kind of, you know, I think we're at a point where we're kind of ushering ourselves into the post RAINO area, if you may say, like using, you know, novel treatment, novel uh, imaging modalities to kind of guide our treatment decision-making. Um, and, you know, we've kind of looked at a variety of uh, methods. Um, you know, we have a pretty robust clinical practice here. So we've been looking at, uh, you know, MR perfusion, for example, uh, uh, for de detecting, uh, you know, treatment changes uh, in uh, high grade gliomas. And our sensitivity and specificity was, you know, you know, kind of on par with the literature, 61%, 88%. Um, and we kind of looked at, uh, we looked at this a little further and said, well, why is it, you know, so low? And so we thought, well, you know, obviously there's some heterogeneity in the tumors when you look at these MR perfusions, um, you know, you're getting a single voxel, but that doesn't accurately capture the whole tumor itself. So, um, you know, we kind of sat down with our neuropathologist and, you know, dissected each tumor out and kind of calculated an active tumor fraction and saw whether or not that quantitatively correlated to the, you know, relative cerebral blood flow and cerebral blo blood volume. And for gliomas, uh, you know, it was very, very, you know, correlated very well, um, you know, but metastasis and, you know, uh, patients who had brain metastasis who had been previously radiated, previous chemotherapy, there was like not a great correlation. So we kind of found ember perfusion is kind of useful for uh, high-grade gliomas for treatment related changes, but not, not necessarily for metastasis. Uh, so we said, okay, let's take it a step further. So we went to the literature and kind of looked at all the different modalities for diagnosing treatment related changes um, uh, for gliomas. Uh, specifically, and we looked, and this is in the neuro, Journal of Neuro-Oncology, and, uh, and we determined that kind of MR spectroscopy was probably the best modality uh, for detecting these, uh, detecting these, uh, for at least predicting the pathology. And this is across like the literature, this was a few years ago, um, but uh, because of that, I think a lot of our work is focused on MR spectroscopy, and this, uh, our data here was looking at single voxel MR spectroscopy, uh, but now we've kind of, with the help of Dr. Maudsley and Dr. Goriwala, uh, we've kind of been able to uh, move to kind of this three-dimensional whole brain MR spectroscopy, which is kind of pioneered at Emory and here as well, and uh, very similar to the kind of uh, data you were showing, but we're able to kind of, you know, have a kind of a heat map of the brain with its choline NAA ratios, and even you can do uh, myonositol as well, um, and we're able to see really nice kind of, uh, you know, hot spots. Uh, for, you know, for basically choline NAA, and, and we we're trying to determine whether or not that kind of predicts either tumor grade and uh, uh, gene mutations, or, uh, and even may even predict, um, you know, the, uh, the IDH wild type uh, mutation status. So, um, you know, this was quickly a paper that you know, demonstrated that, you know, IDH mutant uh, tumors tended to have a higher choline NAA ratios compared to IDH wild type, which we thought was kind of interesting. Um, and so that was kind of, I'll kind of cut to the chase and kind of show my case real quick. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a patient kind of, uh, you know, we, we kind of, I thought this kind of demonstrated the utility of the whole brain MR spectroscopy, but this is a 65 year old male who presented with seizures, uh, presented outside hospital uh, in December, 2017, and had this kind of posterior temporal small enhancing lesion, had another satellite lesion kind of here along the dentorium. 
Uh, uh, and so he had an open biopsy of this lesion. It was IDH wild type, MGMT unmethylated, uh, underwent standard chemo radiation, uh, uh, you know, uh, from uh, January to March, 2018. Um, and, uh, you know, had continued, had, uh, continued to have progression of his disease uh, until about November when he started on a Vastin Everolimus, started having some, uh, some, uh, some response to this. Uh, loss, uh, the, the lesions actually regressed a little bit. Uh, and if you look at the MR spectroscopy at the time, this is the T1, flare, T2, uh, the contrast hand scan, there's not really much here, but if you look on the choline NA, you can see this hot spot here on the contralateral corpus callosum. Uh, and you can see here, there's not really anything here on the other, on the other imaging slices. So we asked ourselves, okay, well, you know, is this, is this, is this clinically significant or not? And if you look down the, down the road, a few months later, you can see every month, two months later, you can see a little bit of nodule enhancement. And then of course, uh, eight months later, uh, you know, fulminant disease along the, along the corpus callosum. So, you know, this was very useful because this is a very early biomarker of, of distant spread of this patient. And so I guess my question to you is, you know, if you see the patient like this in November 2018, do you plan for early radiation to this area, uh, given that it's a hot spot, even though it's negative on all the other imaging? Uh, you know, that, you know, that's an interesting question. And then, you know, uh, and then if you, if, you know, in the preoperative setting, you know, do you use this as a marker for extensive surgical resection as well? So that's kind of like my, my two questions for you. Well, I would say that if you go back to your flare imaging, that you had in your previous scan. Do you see that there's, uh -huh. it looks like there's some abnormal flare and it'd be interesting yeah. to see, yeah, exactly. Be interesting right. to see what that looked like with your flare because we know with, with Avastin, right? Contrast enhancement gets better and you can see this concomitant increase in flare in sometimes remote areas of the brain as a result. So, so I would be interested, you know, the, the next uh, slide you presented, you had the serial contrast enhancing, it would have been very interesting to look at your flare because already in January, you can see there's more mass effect in this in the corpus callosum, right? The splenium. You can see that that's thickened and you're starting to right. see a wisp of enhancement there a little bit um, right. before it's florid in, in July. So right. I think that um, the standard imaging is showing some changes, maybe not on the contrast pictures, but I, I would anticipate probably the flare, you probably did see something happening at that point. Yep. But it's a good, it's right. a good um, example of um, when we have these non-enhancing changes, uh, what do we do with that? And do we declare that patient progress and then move on to other treatments? Early on in the Avastin, using Avastin, because we saw these changes, it's kind of one of the impetus for the RANO criteria, right? Because um, the, the standard assessment for post-Avastin treated patients didn't even consider flare changes. And we were seeing changes in flare that we actually biopsied. And if you look at the ADC, it was bright on ADC as well. So what would be interesting to see in these serial changes that you have here, not only the standard anatomic like you have here, but the ADC perfusion um, and flare changes. Um, so that's just a comment. Um, but I would have been, Absolutely. I would be concerned that that is a hallmark of, of, of distant disease. And the question then, of course, is do you radiate that front area? Do you biopsy it first to confirm? And then do you, do you proceed with treatment with like radiation? Because this is far away from the original radiation um, treatment, so. Right, and then, and then I, guess, I, guess, and I guess if you see this patient, they've already gone radiation in that area, do you recognize this? Do you, do you use this kind of tool as an early recognition of treatment failure, you know? So that's right. another kind of exactly. tool as well. Exactly, yeah. That's a I very nice, uh, it's a nice uh, representation of the challenges, I think, in the post Avastin treated patient as well. Absolutely. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Love to chat oh. with you later. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Macarena, did you have any questions to sum summarize us? Yeah, I think it was a, you know, fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. I think my question is more like uh, general. So how we move, you know, from here, like uh, forward, uh, how we can standardize, you know, these advances in machine. I think, you know, we are probably good in, in many different centers. You know, I can have this 2-hydroxyglutarate MRI and we can have this uh, uh, MRS uh, done, but then, how we can standardize that kind of a new RANO criteria or what's the next step so we can 
really validate the use of these. We can incorporate these uh, e-machine in clinical trials and, and really can uh, understand more about, you know, early changes in this tumor, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, at our SNOW meeting last year, we had a RANO update. Um, uh, and at that meeting, one of the biggest questions was, um, what about RANO for high-grade glioma? And what if, where do we go forward with it? And in fact, um, we will be again at ASCO this year. ASCO, unfortunately, is going to be virtual again. But we will have another RANO session. And these are the kinds of questions that we will be asking. And as you know, RANO is a volunteer group. It's, it's just a, you know, a number of us get together and, and sort of try to come up with consensus and guidelines. So what I'm gonna do is reach out to you guys um, to, to be active participants in the working groups. And uh, this is what we need. We need um, you know, talented, uh, really enthusiastic people like you. And, um, and, and it'd be great to have you participate and be part of that change that we want to have because it, it, it's good for the field. It's good for the patients, right? In terms of how we assess their, their, their care. So um, I can share with Michael um, the link. I think the link just went out this week for registration to the Rano meeting. So I can share that with Michael. He can send it to you guys. And uh, we look forward to you participating and asking these tough questions to us. That would be great. It, it almost seems like, uh, sorry, that, that, that as we know more about glioblastoma, the idea of having one treatment that's going to treat all glioblastoma is, is kind of fading. And we now know that it's going to be very focused to your type and what your subtype is and whatnot. And it almost seems like you're going to have to group in the imaging to that and say that one imaging is not going to be for all glioblastoma. But if you have this subtype and you're, you're treating with this specific targeted therapy, then that targeted therapy will be paired up with one type of imaging. Yeah. And it won't be one, one sort of imaging that will encompass everything in response to every drug. Especially with immunotherapies on the, on the horizon, right? Um, who knows what we're seeing in the brain sometimes after these treatments and probably also the oncolytic virus. So another group that's starting, um, we just had a first meeting a couple of weeks ago is um, trying to standardize um, the oncolytic viral therapy treatments and how we assess changes in that particular patient population. And then what sort of immune monitory types of changes do we need to encompass as well as the uh, non-invasive imaging. So, you know, the, the, the liquid biopsies, the immunological markers, all of those things that are very, very important if we're trying to understand the effects that these types of therapies are having uh, on our patients. So, so that's another working group that if you're interested in participating in. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? No? Okay, great. Well, Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, I just want to thank you again so much for your time. That was inspi inspirational, and, and we have a lot of work to do, and, and, uh, and we're, we're excited to, to kind of collaborate in any way. So we'll be looking forward to that in the future, and, and I hope you stay safe out there in the West Coast. Yeah, thank you again for asking me to participate. It's really great to meet you all, and I look forward to seeing you at another meeting, another Zoom meeting, <laughs> hopefully in person soon, right? Hopefully soon, hopefully yeah. soon. Okay, thank you. Everybody have a good night. Bye-bye.